Okay. Todd Wilkinson has been writing about Greater Yellowstone and the West for more than three decades with other assignments that have taken, taken him around the world. Author of several critically acclaimed books, including one about Grizzly 399 with Tom Mangelson, he is presently a correspondent for, the Nas for National Geographic and The Guardian. He also is founder of the nonprofit public interest journalism site Mountain Journal at mountainjournal.org, holding a special fondness for Jackson Hole, where he wrote a popular newspaper column for a quarter century. He believes people who live here and come to visit are up to the challenge of achieving a new way of approaching conservation that has never been done before. Todd Wilkinson. Thank you, Leah. It's uh, great to, that everybody's here. Um, what more fun than bringing people who care about Greater Yellowstone together. And uh, before I uh, go on anymore, I just wanna thank the Teton County Library and the Jackson Hole Historical Society and this uh, public events uh, person, a tour de force, Leah Schlachter. Leah, take a bow, thank you. So I, I wanna to begin tonight um, by just saying something about journalism. What journalism does best is not document or serve as a court reporter that chronicles events as they fly by us. But I think the best use of what we do is to foster better conversations that are forward looking. And as we all know, the last few years have been tough for science and for truth and for facts. And tonight we're going to return back to the baseline and realize how important facts are, particularly if we're going to be able to have a vision looking forward. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce the speakers. I'm gonna have a short introduction here and then I'll introduce the speakers and uh, they're gonna um, share some thoughts about their work and this place that uh, we call Greater Yellowstone. But before I begin, I'm just curious um, if those of you who have beamed in, if you could leave a note there, you just first name or first and last name, whatever you want, tell us where you're from tonight. I would love to know um, where you're beaming in from. Uh, I think it'll be fascinating. So how lucky we are to be gathered here tonight to be talking about the fate of the last great mammalian ecosystem in the lower 48. And it's a miracle, frankly, that we're still talking about it because we are the only, we are the last place standing that's like it, that has all of its original mammals that were here in 1491 when Europeans arrived. And it's something that I think a lot of people take for granted. Um, if I talk to people on the streets in Jackson or Bozeman or Cody or West Yellowstone or a lot of the Big Sky, a lot of the greater Yellowstone towns, there are people who don't realize how great this is. People who think the, of it as this great recreation playground, and, it, and indeed it is, or they think about greater Yellowstone for Yellowstone Park and its 10,000 geothermal features, and indeed it's magnificent. But what we have here is, is just a, a dynamic process that plays out at the landscape level. And tonight we're going to have three experts who can speak to that and put the context on what's at stake here. So what I'd like to do is begin, have a look at this image. This is the image of Greater Yellowstone. It is of course an artificial construct that conforms to geography. And across this, we have lots of different things happening. The biggest is this, we have all of our original mammals. And when you look at this, this assemblage, this visual assemblage, it's important to note that all of the major species, the large ungulates and the predators, they were nearly wiped out 120 years ago. We nearly lost all of them. And so here we are, we have Yellowstone and we have Grand Teton in the center of Greater Yellowstone. And in addition to that, you know, we have the first uh, national forest, uh, forest land preserve uh, between Cody and the, the east boundary of Yellowstone. We have a lot of firsts 
we indeed are the cradle of American conservation. And we're a region that the whole world is watching. So what I wanna emphasize is as a journalist talking with a lot of experts is the only way we're going to be able to save this is by being deliberate and having a plan. So this, this is um, a graphic that uh, Matthew Kaufman and his colleagues put together and it's something that left a huge impression on me in terms of organic function and in terms of thinking about an ecosystem, we used to think about it in terms of watersheds. And Matt will be talking about this, but it is this extraordinary thing. These are elk herds. And if you look at the series of interconnection and the way that they, they move into Yellowstone National Park, as Matt and uh, his colleague, Arthur Middleton have said, it's kind of in some ways like a uh, breathing an elk into the ecosystem and then exhaling them come winter time. So they come into the high country and they move out to the lower country. This thing is, it's remarkable. But what's even more remarkable is, is that a lot of those species that we just looked at also migrate. And so were we to assert their migration corridors, it would be phenomenal and um, again, our experts tonight are gonna to put this in context. So we've recovered grizzly bears. Grizzly bears are back in Jackson Hole. When I was first reporting in Jackson in the 1980s, uh, experts never thought that grizzlies would move back so quickly into Jackson Hole where they had been largely extirpated. And this of course, the most famous bear mother in the world, 399 with uh, one cub is, is out of view there on the right, but she has become a phenomenon and a, a goodwill ambassador for grizzly bears. And of course we have wolves. There are all of these accomplishments that no other region can boast. So I wanna tell a little story. Back in the 1980s, I bought this painting from a local artist in Jackson Hole who's well known named Kathy Whipler. Kathy painted this scene of South Park, south of Jackson Hole. It's this wonderful bucolic scene. Anybody who drives south of Jackson can see that open space on the right. And previously there was a lot more of it. So within the same year that this painting was made, I was driving north with a friend uh, from Hoback headed toward Jackson. It was the winter time. I was tooling along at about 60 miles an hour in my Volkswagen Rabbit and a cow elk jumped out, hit it at 60 miles an hour, totaled the car, brought the car to a dead stop uh, in about 20 feet. And those elk were moving from the east side of the road to the west into the, where South Park is. And in the 1980s, it was easy to assume that this stuff would be permanent and that it would last forever. Indeed, we would think that South Park and that wonderful open space that a number of old guard ranching families have, you know, we assumed that it would always be there. And yet today, of uh, one of the most vocal debates happening in the community of Jackson is what to do with that open space. Is it gonna be infill with people? And what is that gonna do to displace elk? In Bozeman, Montana, in the Southern end of the Gallatin, we are on the verge of losing some of our elk migrations here. And Matt and uh, Gary and Brent can talk about this one of the questions that I do want to ask them later is should we treat wildlife migrations with the same reverence that we treat wild free flowing rivers? And so this is the big one. We have a lot of debates in greater Yellowstone. Um, one of the biggest is the emerging realization of industrial strength recreation, that it isn't just about human population growth on private lands, but it's also about how we're using public lands. What's interesting about this graphic, it was prepared three years ago and it appeared in Mountain Journal. 
And initially people throughout the ecosystem, they circulated this story and they were shocked. There was a lot of denial. And people said, no way, that, that those numbers aren't accurate. But indeed, recently in the newspaper up here, um, the projections are that Bozeman Gallatin Valley is going to move from about 110,000 to 220,000 people by 2040. There are about 500,000 people in Greater Yellowstone today. That is going to double within a couple of decades. And in 17 years, we're going to add enough homes to accommodate people that if we took a Boulder, Colorado and dropped it in a scattershot way from the sky onto private land surrounding the public lands, that's what we're gonna have. One of the things I wanna point out, particularly for the Jackson audience, is that the projection in mid-century shortly thereafter is that I, I have a thing there, population e equals Salt Lake City. The fascinating thing is that today, if you connect the dots between Star Valley to Jackson over to Teton Valley to Rexburg and Idaho Falls, it is already the size of Salt Lake proper. And I say proper, the size of Salt Lake, not the metro area. But there are already 200,000 people in that corridor. The question is what's going to happen to the infill and while there are a lot of great, extraordinary conservation groups working in Greater Yellowstone, there is no great vision. I would um, call out especially the great work of the land trusts in a lot of the valleys, group like VARD in Teton Valley, groups like the Jackson Hole Conservation Alliance, groups like the Park County Environmental Council. Yes, there are a lot of great groups, but they're not able to keep pace with the change that is happening. And again, I'll point you to the top. Bozeman, Montana at the middle of this century becomes Minneapolis size, 440,000 people at, at present growth rates. So what is that gonna do? What is it gonna do? And, and we'll have um, our experts talk about that when you have such population pressure. So at Mountain Journal, I would be grateful if all of you would visit Mojo. It's at mountainjournal.org. We have made Greater Yellowstone our focus, and we use it as a window for thinking about this intersection between humans and nature on the landscape. Indeed, thinking about where we go from here, how can we chart a different course that isn't as destructive as the one that's been followed like a, blindly, like a script elsewhere, and that has resulted in uh, wild ecosystems that are severely compromised and can never be resuscitated. To get to this point, a uh, lot of the American Prairie Reserve is trying to bring back species to the prairie. The thing about Greater Yellowstone is it's here with us right now. It hasn't been lost yet. And again, this is a a cartoon by John Potter. I think you can read that and see what it says. This speaks to the fact that we are all hypocrites uh, and that it does no good to call each other out, nor does it do any good to, to just lament the development that has happened, but it's really what we do from here. And then this is another John Potter, Potter cartoon. This is one that is familiar to our three experts. It's also a scene that's very familiar to people in Jackson, that as Jackson and the valley fills up the Southern Valley, particularly with moose casualties on the Teton Village Road, you know, our, our wildlife passageways across the highway, are they gonna be sufficient enough or are we fooling ourselves? I think we have to have honest discussions about the impact of growth and infill and really figure out, are we gonna be able to save this stuff? And so again, this is what's at stake. And I mentioned in a piece in Mountain Journal that were you to assert all of the, the wildlife migrations, you would stand in awe. But then if you asserted the development grid over the top of that, it would be breathtaking and it would be depressing. And so what I wanna talk about tonight is not only the profound value of science, but also 
the fact of what are aspects of hope and how, how can that hope be achieved. So I'm gonna begin now with our, our first uh, panelist. Gary Tabor is an ecologist and wildlife veterinarian based in Bozeman. In 2007, he founded the Center for Large Landscape Conservation to help advance the science policy and practice of wildlife corridor and ecological connectivity conservation around the world. For the past 35 years, Gary has worked on behalf of large landscape conservation on every continent except Antarctica. At the moment, his organization co-manages with World Wildlife Fund, various wildlife corridor efforts with jaguars in South America, with tigers in India and elephants in East Africa. In Greater Yellowstone, he's best known for being a, uh, his role as champion of the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative and helping Patagonia, the company, design their Freedom to Roam Wildlife Corridor campaign. Gary is chair of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group that connects 100 scientists across 130 countries to protect wildlife corridors and free flowing rivers. The panelists tonight, this would be an excellent um, assemblage of world-class individuals where it held at a natural history museum in London or New York or Washington or Chicago. But by dint of their interests, we have them here in Greater Yellowstone working on this premier ecosystem. And so Gary Tabor, uh, lead us forward. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. First of all, I see a lot of friends in the audience and forgive me for not being as in contact as I should be, but I'm so grateful that you're all here. And I also wanna to thank Todd and Leah and the museum for organizing this and Mojo. And thanks to my um, colleagues on the panel, um, Brett and, and Matt. Um, you're both inspiring scientists in the region and I'm so grateful to be able to speak with you. So let me um, just share my screen. I have a brief presentation to set this up. Can you see that? Thumbs up? Perfect. All right, so uh, Todd gave a wonderful introduction, just one issue, an uh, order of magnitude. I am the chair of the IUCN's Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group, and we're a thousand scientists and practitioners in 130 countries. So it's a, it's a, major, it's a major group that we're trying to advance connectivity conservation. So let me give you the problem statement here. More than 50% of the world is now dominated by people. It's fragmented and fragmenting. And we always think of this as in a static way, like this, like this center uh, GIS image here. But we are living in a dynamic world that's also influenced by climate change. And so all these factors together are putting pressure on the biosphere. The biosphere is in crisis. And it's unprecedented fragmentation that we're seeing across the whole world. You know, and the world is so fragmented that large mammals, like we're gonna talk about today in Yellowstone, can't move, they can't complete their life cycles. There's not enough time or space for them to mate, feed, to finish their, their, their lifespans. And it is, it is contributing to the global biodiversity crisis. Todd talked about roads. And here's the big thing about roads and everyone kind of, underplays roadkill. But every year, and this is the floor number, this isn't the top number, we think this number is wrong about five or six times, that there's 100 million large mammals killed in roadkill around the world each year. And I know everyone has this bias in North America about white-tailed deer, but it is some critical endangered species that are being hammered. For instance, in Tasmania, the Tasmanian devil, four to 500 Tasmanian devils are killed on Tasmanian roads in Australia. This is a major underreported issue. The amount, of con the amount of impact on wildlife overwhelms anything we talk about with regards to poaching. And roads, every road that you know right now 
will double in the next 25 years. And in many places that have never seen a road before. Boris Johnson, just in the island of the UK, said that there'll be 6,000 kilometers of new roads in the UK. And guess what's gonna happen with post-COVID economic stimulus and infrastructure? A lot of emphasis is gonna be on roads. Are they gonna be our friends or are they gonna create more headaches? So connectivity conservation, dealing with wildlife corridors. We've done a great job with protected areas and, and creating parks like Yellowstone. They are the heart, the lungs of nature conservation, but we've done a really poor job with saving the circulatory system of nature. And that's where connectivity conservation is coming in because it gives the resilience that allows protected areas and landscapes to function to you know, do the, maintain the ecological processes that sustain nature. What's rising in, in you know, the science is becoming more mainstream in what's called connectivity conservation. And it's not about you know, conserving your cell phone coverage. This is ecological connectivity conservation. And I know a lot of folks just go right to wildlife corridors when they hear this but it's one of many of the critical connective functions, ecological processes that are required for nature to be sustained. And that includes like stream flows and like gravel bed streams in, in, in the Northern Rockies. It includes pollination. Um, that includes climate resilience. Today, I was on a call with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. They're not building a wildlife corridor. They'll be, they're building a climate corridor. They need to protect the water of the headwinds that feed all the major populations that surround the Appalachian Mountains. If you look at this interest in wildlife corridors and connectivity conservation, it is rising exponentially around the world. We looked at 550 con connectivity plans in about 70 countries. And what we found is this exponential trend led by North America, but other continents are, are coming up in the same way. And we believe that's because people can see now the cumulative impacts of fragmentation and the impacts of climate. And connectivity conservation is one of the few things like protecting wildlife corridors that can buffer the impacts of climate change because species have to have the room to respond to these changing environmental conditions. This year, we put out the first global guidance for conserving ecological corridors in the context of what we call ecological networks for, for the World Commission on Protected Areas. We had 16 core authors from 30 countries with 150 reviewers. So here's, the, here's a vision. In a world that's growing more fragmented, parks and protected areas alone cannot save the ecological functions that save nature. We need room for wildlife to move and for ecological process to function. We connect protected areas with ecological corridors or wildlife corridors, and they make up what's called ecological networks. And this is how you save nature at scale in a fragmented world. So if you were to map all the protected areas that we know of right now as islands in a, in a blue sea behind, this is the 15.4% of the world's protected areas because that's what the coverage is now on a blue background. And there is conversation now globally, 50 countries are signing up for what's called 30 by 30 or protecting or conserving 30% of land and water by the year 2030 because we know we're not protecting enough nature in our planet as our humanity grows. But the problem is, is that if we just make these blobs bigger, we're not going to solve the problem. We also have to have connectivity. So this comes to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, Yellowstone National Park, the first park, the first, one of the first managed ecosystems in the world, the global standard that everyone looks up to and thinks it is an ideal, but they don't know. They, you know, they have an idealized image of Yellowstone. And the question is, are we gonna manage this, this ecosystem like we did in the creation in 1872 in the 19th century mindset? Or are we gonna think about Yellowstone in a connected way, looking to the future that a connected landscape is an effective and sustainable landscape? So I put it to my two colleagues who will speak next on these issues. 
But the main thing is, is that how we're doing or how we're doing management in Yellowstone now is not how we can do Yellowstone management in the future. Not only are the threats that Todd talked about are important, but the fragmentation that's happening all across the world is right here in center in our own backyard. Thank you. Todd? Thank you, Gary, that was excellent. Well done, I can't wait to jump into the questions. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Matthew Kaufman, who is uh, co-founder of the Wyoming uh, Migration Initiative, which has been this game-changing project in getting us to think about the Northern Rockies. Matt grew up in rural Southern Oregon, the son of a horse logger and an elementary school teacher. He received his uh, bachelor's in biology from the University of Oregon in 1992 and his PhD in environmental studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz in 2003. Kaufman is a wildlife biologist with broad or organizational background uh, focusing on organisms and he's worked across a number of ecological disciplines blending traditional field work with ecological models to address conservation and management issues. Again, you all should check out the Wyoming Migration Initiative website, and it is an honor just as to have Gary, to have uh, Matt Kaufman here. Matt, take it away. Great. <clears throat> thanks, Todd, uh, and thanks for Leah for organizing. Um, and um, can everybody see my uh, slides here? Yeah. Thumbs up? Okay. All right, well, um, it, you kind of set this up well, Todd. It's nice to go right after Gary. I think you, Gary kind of laid out some of the big picture ideas really well. What I'm gonna do is just kind of tell one story um, about some of the migration work that we have done and what we're learning about um, the importance of migration uh, and some of the tools that, that we need to use to uh, conserve migrations right here in the greater Yellowstone. There we go. So in 2014, my colleague Hall Sawyer uh, discovered this mule deer migration. Um, it's 150 miles, at least the purple version is, uh, the, the purple segment. And uh, we refer to this as the Red Desert to Hoback migration. And uh, this was quite a discovery when, when, when Hall put out collars down here in the Red Desert. They, he thought he was studying a, a mule deer herd that lives year round in the desert. But in fact, they don't stay there year round. In the spring, they migrate up uh, along the foothills of the winds up into the, the Hoback River drainage just south of, of Jackson. We've been continuing to study this, this herd um, since 2014, trying to understand there's three different strategies here. And, and we don't really have many data sets that look at the long-term implications of these different migra migration strategies. So in 2016, we put out, uh, we started a new study, or just continued this study and put out new collars. And one of those animals, all these collars have, um, they're, they're, they're connecting with a GPS to get the location of the animal every couple hours, but they're also sending like one location a day to us via satellite that we literally get in our email. And one of those animals um, did just what it was supposed to do, followed the 150 miles up to the Hoback, but whereas the, all of the rest of the herd stopped and summered there in the Hoback, this deer, deer number 255, kept going around the Grovance down into Jackson Hole, right through Moran Junction, around the northern foothills of the Tetons to Island Park, Idaho. And so we're watching this. This is happening during spring, early summer. You know, we're watching this unfold on our computers. And at this point, we thought, okay, either there's two options here. Either this animal, you know, immigrated, emigrated from Wyoming, fell in with a bad group of mule deer from Idaho and went to Island Park and isn't coming back, 
right? A dispersal. Or maybe this is her migration. Maybe the rest of the herd does 150 mile migration, but she does a 240 mile migration. So we were really excited. Uh, we knew um, this is like, so we're, we're in July here. We knew we just had to wait until um, the fall and early winter came and the snows would push her back if this was in fact her migration. And then her collar failed. Um, we lost complete uh, touch with this animal. The, the, the VHF signal failed, the satellite communication failed. We had no idea where she was. And my um, PhD student, Anna Ortega, has, you know, was looking long and hard for nearly two years to find this animal. Um, never could hear a peep from her. Until, until um, March of 2018, we were re-catching this herd down in the Red Desert and the helicopter brought in an animal with an, one of those old brown collars. And when Anna got her hands on the animal, she, she, she looked at the collar and she memorized the serial number because she'd been listened for that animal so many times and she knew it was Deer 255. So she'd come, she'd come all the way back. And, um, and when we put a fresh GPS collar on her to see if she would go back to Idaho again. And this is what she did in that, that first spring. And then with the new collar, spring of 2018, she went all the way back to Island Park, um, came right along the same route, all the way back down to the Red Desert in the fall of 2018. Last summer, she went back up. She didn't make it all the way to Island Park. She summered just south of um, Moran Junction. And this summer, she made it a little bit farther, but not back to Island Park. She, she uh, summered up by uh, uh, just north of, the, of the, the Tetons. And in November, December, we caught up with her. She was in a stopover down in the Prospects on her way to the Winter Range. Uh, and she's now you know, all the way down to the Red Desert back on her Winter Range. When we caught up around the Prospects, um, we were excited to see that she brought two fawns with her. We knew she was pregnant with twins uh, last year, but we were excited to see that she brought those two fawns with her. And this is really important because this, this deer has, um, you know, it's just one deer, but it's raised a lot of questions. And one of those questions is how do these animals make these migrations? And I don't have time to go into the details, but essentially we consider this a type of animal culture. There's no, these animals aren't born with a map. They're not, it's not in their genes to make this particular migration. They have to learn it. They learn it from their mothers and other animals in the group. And so you can think of this 240 mile migration as a type of oral tradition, except, you know, they, they tell it with their hooves. And so that's a really important point for conservation because it means that you know, if in order to maintain these migrations, we have to maintain the animals that have the knowledge of how to make these movements. And if we lose the animals, um, it, it, it will take decades, if not generations, if, if not centuries, um, for them to relearn these migrations. Okay, and so, um, so we've been really concerned about the conservation of these, these migrations, which is why we created the Wyoming Migration Initiative. And this one is really complicated. As these animals migrate, they cross many different uh, land ownerships, about 100 different fences, four different highways. And one of the most important um, uh, threats to these animals, most important obstacles, is, is right up near Pinedale, right near Fremont Lake, if you can see my cursor, in this red area. This is a place where um, it's essentially a bottleneck where these animals um, at this point, there's four to 5,000 animals that squeeze through a quarter, mile, a quarter mile bottleneck. And you can see this on the next slide. Here's, here's a map of that migration. And you can see that they squeeze through the growing town of Pinedale and Fremont Lake, this deep glacial lake. And this area in red was a piece of private property that was up for development to be converted to lakeside cottages, which would have just plugged up the corridor. And, um, but this is a story about the power of maps. Once we mapped it, it was very clear to see that this was the greatest risk to this migration. And so the conservation fund, when that parcel went up for sale, the conservation fund raised $2 million 
to purchase that property and turn it into a wildlife habitat uh, management area. And folks came together to remove all the fences. And now this, this area is protected in perpetuity for the movement, for the migration of these animals um, through this, this important um, seasonal habitat. And I kind of want to just end with this picture um, because I think it speaks to uh, the challenge ahead for conserving these types of migrations. What do you see in this picture? What I see is people that are coming together, doing a lot of hard work, pulling up fences to make a migration, a seasonal journey easier, not for themselves, but for these mule deer, these wildlife that we share this ecosystem with. And I think the thing that we have learned through research and mapping these corridors is that this is doable. We talk about in, in environmental issues, we talk about wicked environmental problems. These are problems that almost have no solution. This problem has a solution and we have lots of tools to implement that solution. Road crossings, um, conserving big private ranches, um, modifying fences, and we have the science as well um, in terms of the migration maps. So this is, a, this is an environmental problem that we can solve, um, especially if we have the political will to do it. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was great. Great. And again, I can't wait to get back to asking you some questions as well. Uh, next, we have Brent Brock. Uh, he's up in Bozeman. Um, we've had many a discussion about growth issues up here, uh, highest growth area in Greater Yellowstone. Brent received a Bachelor of Science degree in wildlife biology in 1985 and a master's uh, in rangeland ecology in 1997 at Kansas State. He works as the Northern Rockies landscape lead and spatial analytics lead for the Rocky Mountain program of the Wildlife Conservation Society. He has 30 plus years experience focused on applying GIS and spatial analysis in the fields of ecology and conservation science. His work has focused on everything from cockroaches and cicadas to bison and grizzly bears. For the past decade, much of Brent's focus has been on large landscape wildlife connectivity and developing advanced tools to improve land use planning to minimize the impact of rural sprawl on wildlife. Brent is dedicated to protecting and restoring one of the most biologically intact ecosystems in North America. His current focus is on developing innovative solutions for preserving working lands and improving stewardship for wildlife they contain in the face of increasing threats from rapidly growing human population. Brent, welcome. Thanks, Todd, and, and thanks, Leah, for uh, pulling this together. And thanks also to my esteemed colleagues that preceded me. The, the, the beauty of going last is that the big picture has already been laid out. You, you know what needs to be done out there. And so I'm going to keep this fairly short. And what I want to do is um, kind of speak from the heart of what I see in the ecosystem today. And um, it is um, it, 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 it's both uh, inspirational and fills me with pride but also terrifying at the same time. And so I'm gonna start with the dreaded boring graph. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I did this intentionally because, uh, you know, Todd mentioned earlier, he showed that poster of all of the mammals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, that we still have all of the mammals that were here uh, before European contact and, and um, that's something to celebrate. But he also mentioned that we almost lost them. And there's much beauty in this graph because this is just a reminder that that didn't just happen. Um, you know, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is not some relic that was somehow spared from, from the um, 
losses that occurred throughout most of the continent, um, they occurred here as well too. And so what you're looking at here is a graph of the elk population in Montana. Um, and you can see that, you know, in as late as the 1920s, we only had about 8,000 elk on the landscape here. And, um, you know, I use this just as a representative example because, you know, this trend would be repeated throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. It would be very similar to this. And it gets repeated again and again for, you know, pronghorn antelope, for bighorn sheep, um, you know, you name it, including all of the many species that we never collected data on, um, but they're still here with us. And it's just a reminder that it took a lot of work to, to save this ecosystem and to bring it to where it is now, to where we now have about 150,000 elk in Montana. Um, and so we can enjoy what looks like an abundance of wildlife to us. And it is an abundance of wildlife to us. So it's something to really be celebrated. And, you know, through the early part of the 20th century, you know, most of the wildlife conservation focused on uh, those big game mammals and some of the other species. But by the, towards the end of the 20th century, we had moved on and, and um, elevated to start looking at the predators as well too. By the end of the 20th century in the 1990s, we actually were able to um, reintroduce wolves into this ecosystem. And now in the early part of the 21st century, we have wolves fully restored on the landscape. Grizzly bears uh, are recovered. They have been expanding their range at a little over a mile a year for the last 30 years. So they are reclaiming uh, former historic range across the landscape. And that in itself is pretty much a miracle. And I look at this ecosystem and I think, if, if we can recover grizzly bears in an area this populated in a modern industrial landscape, we can do anything. Um, you know, the, the fantasy for conservation of being able to have our cake and eat it too is not a pipe dream. If, if we can recover something like a grizzly bear, we can do this. But at the very moment where we're at that, that cusp, I think, of being able to claim ourselves as the first region to be able to fully both restore and secure um, an intact community of of species in all of its wild in this landscape, we're also facing unprecedented uh, challenges. You know, the popularity of this area has ballooned thanks to the conservation successes that we have. We have all this wild space, these wildlife amenities, and that's attracted a lot of people. I would venture to guess that most of us on this call today probably moved here from somewhere else. I would also venture to guess that a lot of us were attracted to this area because of the wild amenities that, that it provides for us. So the population is booming. So what does that mean for us now? Um, so I was thinking about this a couple of months ago and I decided to do a little desktop thought experiment. I'm a map guy, so I decided let's make a map. And so I just pulled up a few papers that I had available. This wasn't a deep you know, scientifically rigorous literature review is just, um, you know, sticking with the theme of elk, I thought, what does the science tell us about what the landscape looks like to elk on this, in this area out here? And so I pulled up data for Western Montana and I, and I found through the papers that I had on hand and then I just mapped out what the disturbance zones that have been documented through scientific analysis tell us um, about the impacts that we're having on elk as they, as they live and move through this landscape. So, um, and by disturbance, I mean those areas where uh, elk have been documented to either avoid or alter their behavior, show signs of stress, otherwise become less wild. Um, so let's start with the homes that we live in. So this is what that disturbance envelope for Western Montana looks like just for our homes and buildings on the landscape. And you can see that, you know, most of our homes are in the valley bottoms. Those are the destinations of those migration routes that, um, that we've seen here. Those are the, that's the winter range. That's also the areas where our riparians flow, 
riparian areas flow through. It's where we get our clean water. Um, it's also grassland habitat, which holds a disproportionate number of the species in most need of conservation in this region. And these are the connectivity zones between the mountains um, so that we can continue to have expanding grizzly bear populations and we can continue to have wolverine um, existing in this landscape. So that's the buildings. Um, the next one we can consider is the roads. And that's the disturbance zone around the road network in Western Montana. Um, so you can see that, you know, we're filling up the landscape as elk move across this landscape. They are contending with a lot of human activity out there. And then, but we do still have these wilderness areas and roadless areas um, left on the landscape. So there, there's a few bright spots in there. Um, for elk searching for quiet spaces. But now let's put the recreational trails in. And again, this is not a scientifically rigorous analysis. As a scientist, I would wanna dig much, much deeper into this to be able to understand what it's really telling us. But I think this image should at least have us sit back and acknowledge that as the wildlife are moving across the landscape, we are already asking an awful lot of them to contend with our activities on that landscape. And you have to wonder, you know, where are the thresholds of, uh, of tolerance? Um, are we heading toward a collapse? I don't know if we are, um, but I'm worried about it. And I do believe that, you know, what we decide to do in this coming decade is probably going to determine whether or not we remember the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as the crowning achievement for humanity, where we reach that ideal of finding that magical balance between the needs of people and the needs of nature, um, or a cautionary tale of a paradise lost. And that's all I've got, thanks. Thank you guys. Um, I would like to lead off with a question uh, that gets addressed to each of you. Uh, you all know of David Halleck, the former science chief in Yellowstone. We tend to think of death by a hundred cuts, but Dave Halleck has said, you know, greater Yellowstone is getting nicked by death by, you know, a thousand scratches or a death by, death by 10,000 scratches. So what I'd like each of you to do is riff a little bit, particularly on this uh, private land component of what you see. And I just would like, you know, since we're having a, a brutally honest discussion tonight, um, I would like to know what it is that worries you and, um, you know, what do we need to be paying attention to in terms of urgency and without getting into politics, from a scientific perspective, what do we need to be protecting? Do you wanna direct that to? Yeah, why don't you start, Gary? Okay, well, first of all, I think the problem is, is that people, because of these cumulative longer term impacts that happen in places where people can't see or feel those impacts, they don't understand the problem that's facing this ecosystem. And so there's no dashboard of what's going on here. So we have no feedback loop. And, you know, we have to hand it to, you know, Wyoming Migration Initiative and the GIS work of, of Brent. They're trying to visualize these problems because right now it's out of sight, out of mind. And until we can start to see this dashboard of information, people don't won't know what to do. So I feel the first challenge we have right now, right now is people have to see what the health is and how this landscape is changing. Otherwise, it's an abstract con a concept. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I guess, in thinking about the scratches, I mean, we all scratch ourselves, but we know when to stop, right? <laughs> because we start to bleed, right? We can tell when we're inflicting harm on ourselves. But when we think about something like migrations, like it's scratch after scratch after scratch, and 
even when we've got you know lots of collared animals and and lots of ways to monitor these uh, systems, we can't tell which ones are bleeding, right? We can we can measure the scratches and and we have a lot of different interest groups that want to argue about whether those scratches are causing harm. And then we rely on science to quantify, um, you know, the, the effect of, of all those scratches. And frankly, you know, when it comes to something like animal movement, it is extremely challenging to quantify, you know, when uh, these large landscapes have just become um, intolerable or are or, um, cut up too much to, uh, to support these migrations. And so, you know, the way I, we, we, in, in the migration world, in the animal movement world, you hear a lot about barriers and you, and you hear a lot about really obvious barriers like the road across the Serengeti. And those types of barriers, like they're really easy to visualize and really, really easy to think about. Of course, we don't want a road that bisects the Serengeti wildebeest migration. But all of these scratches, or they might be holes um, or, or, or cuts in the landscape, basically none of them are complete barriers that we can easily visualize. Instead, they impair the system, they impair the migration, and that creates what ecologists call a sink. So you have one segment of the population that is still using that migration that they've learned and that they're gonna use for the rest of their life, but now it's no longer profitable. But they keep using it and they just drain out until you know, that segment of the population has been lost. And we sort of, I think we can easily connect the dots and know that this is how it happens, but it's really difficult to see that in real time. These are things that happen uh, uh, you know, across one scientist's lifetime. And when we look back at, you know, how many animals there were when that segment started draining out, you know, we don't have good data. We don't have any movement data. It's all we have is this blurry sense of the past. Um, so these are, these are challenges um, in, in terms of how we visualize and, and monitor and understand the system because they, they, they happen, it's a, it's a very subtle effect and it happens um, slowly. Uh, which makes it very difficult to react in terms of the conservation measures that are needed to, to stem these declines. I see a lot of sad faces on the Zoom there, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, th I'll just follow up on that to say that, you know, I, we, we tend to look for, um, we wanna know what the threshold is. What, what is the tolerance and you know if we want to be able to go right up to that line and not cross it and the truth of the matter is we're never going to know what that is because it's subtle and it and it impacts different species differently and it impacts different individuals differently on the landscape and some of these things are so difficult to see there were you know a number of years ago um, Andy Hansen and Jay Rotella at uh, Montana State published a paper on warblers in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And they found that, um, you know, warblers uh, up in Yellowstone uh, reproduced at a lower rate than they died. So it was a sink, as Matthew was saying. Um, and so the way Yellowstone um, remains populated with yellow warblers is that uh, warblers that are breeding down lower in the riparian areas along the Madison River and other areas are reproducing at a rate that provides a surplus. And so that's what continually feeds the um, Yellowstone National Park with the warblers so that you can have that, that species in that landscape. But what they found was when those areas were subdivided and became subdivisions, the reproductive rate of the lower elevation riparian areas declined to the point that they were no longer producing that surplus anymore. And so here was an example of impacts on a bird that is going to continue to exist. You know, people will see yellow warblers out their back doors and along the rivers as they go along. But what they don't realize is that they're not reproducing at a rate high enough to be able to feed this um, area that's at higher elevation. Lower you got elevation really quiet, Brent. 
Yeah. What? We lost you. Are you there? Are you with us? I can hear you. You can't hear me? I'll come back. <laughs> okay. All right. So one thing I would like uh, our panelists to address, we're getting lots of questions about wildlife corridors in general, and some have asked about the approximate width, and some of you have said, you know, that there is no prescription for exactly what, what it is. Um, Dan asks, this presentation does a great job of describing the what needs to be done. Please begin to address some of the mechanisms of how to accomplish that. So whoever wants to jump in, raise your hand and uh, go for it, Matt or Gary. Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we didn't, well, we got into it a little bit, but, um, you know, some of this, some of this work is being done, um, for migration corridors. I think one of the things that, um, has really been proven up in Wyoming is that you have to map the corridor. You can't, um, you can't manage and conserve something that, that you can't see and that you don't know where it is. So um, one of the things that's happened over the last decade in the, on the research side is um, new tools that allow us to take all the sort of spaghetti lines of individual animal movements and put them together um, through statistical analyses to come up with a, with a, with a corridor that, you know, that has a, a specific width. And, um, Wyoming, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department has a, has a state program to do that in Wyoming, where we have some of the West's longest and most intact migrations. Um, and over the last few years, um, other Western states have been doing this work as well. So now there's kind of a West-wide effort to map migration corridors. Um, and those maps are really, um, you know, really useful, like the Fremont Lake uh, bottleneck that I talked about. When we did that work, we identified that was one of 10 impediments that we identified. Um, and that's really become sort of a model of, you know, mapping where the animals go, where they need to go. Then you can overlay that on these big landscapes, identify where the threats are, and identify where the conservation solutions are. And and this is, this is something that is um, sort of picking up all across the West. Um, the Department of Transportation in many different states, you know, these overpasses and underpasses that you see, and many of those are, are being guided by animal movement data, um, wildlife friendly fencing, the land trusts that Todd talked about. So, so that's how you do it, but it's going to take a lot of work. I mean, I showed you one bottleneck. How many other bottlenecks are there in the greater Yellowstone? Probably hundreds. Well, you know, I think that being a resident in the greater Yellowstone, you have to have a land stewardship ethic. I think because of the federal land or public land domain, we cede our interest and responsibilities to federal agencies, not realizing that we as a collective has a, um, have a role in this. We always have this thing, the government is here to help. But no, the reality is that we have to help the government here, especially with regards to what um, you know, Brent just showed us where private lands are such a key, key part of this. And, you know, when I, when I said, what's the future of Yellowstone? Well, it has, it, it, ideally, people think of Yellowstone as a gold standard, but other places have now exceeded us with regards to coexistence. Other places have done well with bringing in native and indigenous communities back and bringing that knowledge into landscapes. We, we're, we're, we're not even there yet. Um, other, other areas are working with stakeholders and conservancies, private land conservancies that have empowered local communities to have a, a big role in, in private land conservation. I feel we just scratched the surface. And I think, you know, as the nation talks about a conservation core, bringing young people in, I hope that, you know, is part of the solution. 
of connecting people to a stewardship ethic in this landscape. Um, but, you know, it is, we can't sit back and watch, we have to participate. Can you hear me now, Todd? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, the, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, my, my answer to, you know, how wide does a corridor need to be is that all we really have right now are rules of thumb, wider, shorter, and straighter. Um, you know, that, that, <laughs> that, that tends to be, you know, the best rules of thumb for, um, for designing corridors that are on the landscape. And so I, I think really as a society, we need to figure out, you know, how important is this to keep these animals on the landscape and how much are we willing to dedicate to them? Because right now, all we can say is these areas still work. These areas don't, but we didn't really document where we lost the corridors. We only, we only know where we have them. So yeah, it's difficult. Okay, um, one thing I want to drill down a little deeper here with you guys, and I want to ask this. So Matt, you guys have report notched incredible success in Wyoming, and in the 20 counties of Greater Yellowstone, some are losing population, some are static, they're still pretty rural. And then we have the high growth areas. We have the Gallatin Valley, we have Paradise Valley, we have the Madison that's protected but still vulnerable. We have Jackson Hole on the southern end and, and Teton Valley. So is there a different strategy of what do you what do you guys recommend for thinking about the high growth areas with lots of people pouring in versus the rural rural valleys where we have more time? So Okay. How do we, how can we deal with growth? Could you hear me? Those on, those on backwards. Brent, you want to go first? I, 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 I don't, I don't want to always be, you know, Gary, Matt and Brent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so in essence, what do we do in the places where there's an urgency? particularly the subdivided valleys that we haven't, they're invisible lot lines. I can, you know, you just mentioned the Madison Valley and I'm gonna show you a graphic here real quick, if that's okay. Oops. If I can get to it. So this is an exercise we did a number of years ago um, when I was at Craighead Institute. And um, this is the Madison Valley where, where you were talking about that it's been protected. And went through an exercise looking at the disturbance zones um, based on uh, Hello. Yeah, these buffers around the. Can you? Did you lose me? Am I gone again? I can hear you. How about you guys? Okay. Sorry about that. I'm just paranoid about my microphone now. Okay. So, so we did this analysis in the Madison Valley, and so you know, 500 500 yard buffers around existing structures on the left here. And that shows, so these gray areas are the conservation easement. 70% of that landscape is under conservation easement, so it's protected. But yet we have the development around the fringes that are out here. And then there's these lots that had not been developed. So that's what you're looking at on the right, is um, what that development would have looked like if, if every lot that was available to be built on, I mean, these are areas that don't need to be subdivided, they're already subdivided. And what it showed was there was a potential to completely lose connectivity across that valley. Now that doesn't mean a grizzly bear can't get across that valley, but it means that they're gonna to have to contend with human activity again and possibly get it, you know, that's just more barbecues, more food dishes, um, more bird feeders and more opportunity to get into trouble and then get taken out of the population as a problem bear. Um, so 
Fortunately, I can say more easements have gone in since then, and we actually do have one fully protected corridor across the Madison Valley, but there's just an example um, of those imaginary lot lines. Yeah, and Todd, I'll, I'll maybe sound a little bit like a broken record, but um, I think what we've seen in, in Wyoming is that you know the mapping can really guide um, this this kind of private land, land conservation. So we've worked really hard to build out the maps, um, make them publicly available. So, you know, right now, the Nature Conservancy, the Wyoming Stock Growers Land Trust, Jackson Hole Land Trust, and others are all using the same, you know, when we get the migration maps done, we make them available and they're, they're all using them to you know, drill in and, and see, you know, where are the big ranches that underpin these migrations? And in Wyoming, we still have a lot of these migrations because so much of the country is, are still these working landscapes, um, big private ranches that stitch together the public lands, the BLM lands that might be the winter range and the forest service lands that are often the summer range. The animals can't get between those big blocks of public land without going through all this private land. Yeah. And we have tools, you know, the land trusts um, are very active in, and the model of putting in conservation easements on these big ranches is a, in many ways, a win-win because it maintains the ranching heritage of those lands, as well as the wildlife heritage of those lands and present, prevents them from being subdivided. The key is we don't have, there's lots of places where there are really important seasonal migrations where we don't yet have the maps. And there's lots of other places that are, all, are perhaps already too far gone in terms of the amount of subdivision that, that has occurred. Um, so it's, you know, it's really hard to get these migrations back once they've been, once, once they've been plugged up with, um, with homes. But Todd, Todd, you asked me one, you said, describe the problem in Greater Yellowstone in one word. And I said intactness. You know, when there's no intactness, as the fragmentation continues, then the con then all the pathologies we see on this landscape. So the world, you know, I was brought in, Todd asked me, because I work at different scales on this issue. And so I'm in conversation at the global scale and the national scale and, and the regional scale. And so my perspective is this, the world is talking about zero fragmentation. That's the goal, stop it. We have to stop the cutting of nature. Why can't we, regionalize this goal in our ecosystem. I mean, we can, we can measure that. We can measure this land use change. And, you know, and then we can measure our success against this land use change. Because what we'll have, if this continues, is what I call relictual conservation. We'll be managing the relics, not the whole organism. So we don't want that. And so I believe this is part of the solution. Okay, I want to um, ask another question, um, and this is one of the 800-pound gorillas in the room. Uh, in a region that has a conservation ethic with lots of, lots of groups, so lots of groups promoting access. So I want the three of you to comment a little bit on outdoor recreation pressure. Some have said it's reaching industrial strength levels with elk being pushed off in the Paradise Valley. So Mr. Tabor, I want you to jump in on that. First of all, we've spoken about the ability of technology to bring people faster, deeper into wild country that previously was protected. So start us off and then uh, I'd love to hear from your other panelists. Well, you know, the back country is becoming day country, you know, in my lifetime. What we thought of as multi-day trips is being done in a day and more people are doing it. Um, the issue is, is that I, I think of Leanne Allison, the Canadian wildlife um, photographer from Banff, and she had cameras um, on uh, wildlife trails outside of Canmore, Alberta. And it's the most hilarious movie because you have people walking at certain parts of the day. And then when the people stop, then you have the wildlife using the trails. And then as soon as they stop, then the people come with their dogs and whatever. And it's, it's almost like, a, you know, one of those, you know, fast motion scenes in, in Manhattan with the red and green lights with, with wildlife and people. I mean, it's insane. It's too funny. 
not to be too sad. So the reality is, yes, this is a big problem. And, you know, can we can, you know, consumption, you know, it's all part of like when they're looking at bending the curve, this is the conversation that's happening globally. How can we bend the curve to save biodiversity? And why do we want to save biodiversity? It's not just about saving species, folks. It's about saving all the interactions those species have that create the clean soils, the clean water, the clean air that creates the healthy biosphere. That's why biodiversity matters. So when we have these conversations about you know, saving species, um, you know, the, this, this issue of consumption comes up and recreation is part of this consumption equation. And, you know, if we're willing to think about new ways of living our lives, if GM can go all electric, why can't we think about how we might live on this planet and our footprint? Thank you. I actually think Gary hit the nail on the head. Um, rec recreation is, is a consumption activity and it's also a development activity as well too. I mean, the, the issues around recreation, and this is not to denigrate recreation, we're all here to recreate. We need recreation, it, it, it's great. We all do it and we need to do it. But we need to understand that it does have impacts and the, the better we acknowledge what those impacts are, the better we can plan and control our activities so that we can balance, you know, the needs for our recreation um, with the needs of wildlife. But you know, it's just I I I don't I don't think that it's it's worth sacrificing our wildlife resources um, in exchange for the ability to go faster, deeper into the forest, um, you know, at, at every whim. Yeah, I want maybe just push back on this idea just a little bit. Um, I think, I mean, obviously when we recreate in the back country, you know, the human disturbance that that creates, you know, animals respond to that, right? They respond um, like they respond to, you know, the risk of predation might cause them to have a little bit less time to feed, move into suboptimal habitats, but, these aren't the same, right? It's not the same as uh, subdividing, subdividing up a winter range or subdividing up a migration corridor, not even close. So, you know, we have to remember, um, like for example, you know, we work a lot with hunters, right? All of the migrations that we work on are hunting. So that, so that means that they're receiving a lot of pressure that, that, that moment of the opening day, um, you know, hunters in trucks, on ATVs, on foot. Um, we just recently did a study, uh, a graduate student of mine asking whether that type of disturbance, the onset of the hunting season could trigger migration of mule deer out of the high country. And you saw the, the common effect that we always see when when hunting starts is that the animals shift away from the roads and into the deeper forest, into so-called so security habitat. But it didn't trigger their migration. Their migration was triggered by the normal things that trigger their migration, deep snow and cold temperatures. So, and you know, in that context, we have to remember, we've been disturbing these animals. We've been hunting these animals for hundreds of, you know, for, for thousands of years, right? These, these animals evolved with predators, including human predators, right? So there's, so that's a very different, so the way our human disturbance interacts with their, interacts with their natural history is very different than the way the disturbance of a subdivision or oil and gas rigs or interstate highways interacts with their natural history. So I don't think we can just, you know, it kind of comes back to it. I think we've talked about sort of the, the threshold level question. And in my mind, you know, we can't just, we shouldn't just be like calling outdoor rec the, boogie, the boogeyman. What we need is good science that can tell us, you know, what are the levels, you know, when, when do these types of activities exceed a threshold where they cause harm? Because, you know, we have to balance these things. And um, 
it's clear that, that animals can tolerate humans um, to, a, to, a, to, to, to some degree. And we just don't know where that, um, where that sort of threshold is. Okay, great, I Brent? Respond to that real quick. I, I agree with everything you said, Matt. I, I mean, that, that's absolutely true. Recreation clearly is not the same as a subdivision or a road or something like that. But we always have to remember that we are doing that in addition to the subdivisions and the roads. Again, getting back to the death by a thousand scratches. So we need to really be looking at those cumulative effects. And again, you know, the tolerances when we have recreation to the level that it's no longer, you know, a group of recreationists that pass by an area every few hours, maybe, you know, four or five times a day. Um, and it becomes a stream of, you know, constant disturbance along that area, then it's going to have a different impact. But but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, everything that Matt said is true. So we, we can't make them equivalent, but we do need to understand that there are impacts and we do need better science to understand how to manage it. We fragment our problems and hence we fragment the solutions. Cumulative, this is all cumulative folks from climate change, subdivisions, recreation, you know, it's, and what is coming, I know there's a lot of innovation on, on movement trackers and, and whatever, but there's innovation coming on determining wildlife stress. New methodologies are coming out. We're gonna know more about how wildlife are feeling in the next 10 years than we ever you know, thought before. I think this is a new field in wildlife science. Okay, let's, uh, there, we have several questions here of people who, are here because they love this place, they, they care about it. What are a few things that each of you would recommend for people who are tuned in here? What, what can they do positively to, to help address this issue and keep critters on the landscape? Matt, jump in. I was slowly realizing in the silence that it was my turn to go first. <laughs> um, but, well, so, um, so I'll speak to migration because that's what I do. Um, so, there's, so there's lots of people that are, that are engaged with this issue, lots. Um, it's uh, in, in, in Wyoming, you know, we've seen that, um, that thinking about valuing the importance of migration and conserving migrations is like a, a bipartisan issue. And uh, there aren't many bipartisan issues in Wyoming. So this is one, and, you know, essentially everybody can see the value of keeping these migrations intact. And lots of people are, um, are, are working on this. So this is everything from, you know, the land trusts um, who, you know, always need funding support. Uh, sportsman groups are, there's, there's quite a few sportsman groups that are using the migration data to identify fences that uh, need to be removed or modified. And um, there's, a, there's a great new initiative called the Absorca Front Initiative um, that's grown up out of Cody, Wyoming. They're using a lot of our migration data to identify, to, to, they're working from the ground up with big, some of these big private ranches um, and identifying the fences that need to be modified and uh, getting out, raising the money to do the work or the, or the volunteer power to get it done. Um, so there's lots of, um, you know, almost all the sportsman groups, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Mule Deer Foundation, Wild Sheep Foundation, all of these groups uh, are, recognize this as an issue and um, are putting their dollars on the ground to, to keep landscapes open. Um, yeah, so there's lots, you know, and then I guess maybe the one other thing I would say, we have a hashtag in the Wyoming Migration Initiative called Know Your Corridors. Um, and we don't know our corridors. Most people don't know the corridors. These are like invisible movements that, you know, nobody knew that Deer 255 and her fawns travel 242 miles one way. Um, you know, she is the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And 
but who knew that? And now, you know, now some more people know about it, but these, you know, we live on a landscape that we're sharing this landscape with all of these, all of these migrating animals, right? And, um, and the landscapes are big and they move across the same places where we live and work. So know your corridors, like know where they are. They're, you know, the, the information is available now. Um, and that's kind of part of the, like, we, um, you know, we have really good maps of our roads and our trails, um, even some of the, you know, the older Oregon trails and all historic trails, right? The maps of these migrations that these animals move should be just as accessible to us. And, and, you know, part of our education, they should be taught in the schools, right? These are ancient paths. They're part of the landscape. So know your corridors is another thing that you can do. Okay, quick question before uh, your colleagues jump in. Matt, uh, is the mapping, is it coming to Montana and Idaho as well? Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, so real briefly, um, Secretary of Zinke in 2018, former Secretary Zinke issued a secretarial order that um, didn't really provide much funding, but provided a lot of motivation for the, for the interior agencies to work with the states to map corridors. And, and, and I've been really involved in that effort and our group here at Wyoming has really been involved with that effort. And um, Montana uh, has been mapping corridors this, over this last year. Um, and they're just involved, they haven't gone public with them because they're, they're involved in kind of a stakeholder process of figuring out um, when and how to roll out their migration corridors, but they've mapped a lot of, uh, especially uh, elk and mule deer corridors, and they have a big effort on pronghorn right now. Um, Idaho has been mapping corridors for the last couple of years. You can, um, we produced a report um, called Ungulate Migrations of the Western US, which you can go online and find. Um, those corridors are, um, are, are all in that map as our corridors from Arizona and Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, and not all, but a lot of those map files are, are publicly available, downloadable. Um, so you can go, um, go to a site called USGS Science Base, which you'll find it if you Google it. But we're starting, you know, we're starting the culture and the practice of mapping the corridors and making them publicly available. Thank you. Gary, Brent? Well, you know, I feel like the story of wildlife corridors is only told through the praise eyes of right now. And I feel like we haven't done a, a good job well with Native Americans and First Nations. They understand those corridors. They've actually knew those corridors for thousands of years. And we're, you know, Western science is just like, oh, look, look what we discovered. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's that perspective. We do a lot of work with corridors with uh, First Nations and, and Native Americans, you know, the Blackfeet Nation did some great work on, on corridor work. Um, the other element is know your prey as well as, know your predators as well as your prey. I feel we're only telling half the story. And I think that does a disservice to getting people involved in coexistence because a lot of times the coexistence problems are with the predators. And if we want to maintain, you know, the ecosystem, we have to learn to coexist with the prey and the predators. So I feel we need to enlarge our vision, both with people and with species in this conversation. I would say, and it's been said several times before, but um, you know, working lands are really the key to this whole thing. I think, um, you know, as I've said, they're the connectivity areas, they're the grassland areas, they're the riparian areas, um, and so you know, the fantasy that I have is, imagine if we could create an economy where sustainably managed ranch lands were more valuable than subdivisions, we wouldn't have to worry very much about what was happening on this landscape. And so I think we really need to think about ranching economies and what we can do to actually um, sustain those well-managed, well-stewarded ranches. And we need to acknowledge that having wildlife in a ranching operation is not always a good thing. Gary mentioned the coexistence part of it. Predators can cause trouble. Um, it can also be trouble if you're a rancher in Paradise Valley and elk that are harboring brucellosis move onto your 
land. That can cause real dollars. But yet, those ranch lands providing elk habitat, providing clean water, are providing services that we all benefit from. So I would really like us to buckle down and figure out ways where we can more equi equitably share um, the costs of those services that we all benefit from and make sure that we keep those working lands on the landscape. The other thing I would say for individuals is this is probably the, the least sexy thing you can possibly do, but it's vital is get involved in planning, whether it be for recreational planning or land use planning. Um, you know, a lot of the, the problems that we see on the landscape, we don't get concerned about it until the bulldozers show up. Well, you're usually about 20 years too late at that point because, you know, the development rights have already been allocated long before those even show up. So get involved in planning, and, and uh, that would be a really important area to, um, to support. Okay. Um, we're going to be coming up in a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want each of you to ask a question of your colleague in a minute, so I want you to think about that. One of the things that's necessarily part of this discussion is money, because money could be a game changer, I bet, uh, Mr. Kaufman, right? So... When you think about money, you mentioned uh, Secretary Zinke, the, the uh, executive order that came down, but it didn't come attached with funding. So when the three of you think about this, are there any funding mechanisms that you see or how, how much would money accelerate this process? And are there any pools of hope out there uh, that we can draw upon or be created? Is it my turn? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, <laughs> money. Oh my God. Well, first of all, having the LWCF, you know, back in action and having a connectivity element uh, to their uh, prioritization um, helps. I mean, it's going to help with all the things that Matt pointed out, what we need with private landowners and protections and easements. That's fantastic. Um, I don't find we have a lot of innovation money. Foundations have been around as the innovators trying to find new ways of doing this. I know that Wyoming Migration Initiatives have had some great innovation investments, but that kind of funding money is very rare. Um, and I don't know if anyone's paying attention to biodiversity funders in the West or in, in the United States, but they're decreasing. Most of the funding is climate change and urban from philanthropies. And so, you know, we don't have that kind of R&D uh, kind of support in, in you know, in, in funding practices. The other um, element is uh, uh, what could come in the future? Well, I think there could be two first. When we start thinking about carbon and paying people for paying for ecosystem services, these things that are being talked about, there might be ways where we might be able to redirect new sources of funding for these kind of problems. But funding is an issue, yes. Um, and uh, um, because, you know, there, it, you know it, the resources are just scarce. And especially in post-COVID world, I even worry, I wor worry more about that. And I would echo what Gary says is that we need venture capital. Um, you know, we need new tools on this landscape because the change is happening faster than the current tools that we have. Conservation easements are fantastic, but they're not for, for every landowner. And you know, I, I did a quick analysis not too long ago across the entire Rocky Mountains region from, the, from Canada to Mexico, about 1% of the landscape has been, of 1% of the high quality habitat landscape on private lands has been um, has been uh, conserved under conservation easement. We need to keep doing that. It's, it's an important tool, but it's not keeping the pace with what we have. So we need venture capital um, on this landscape. And the other one is, as Gary mentioned this as well too, is you know, I think things like carbon markets um, have some real potential in this area, but we should expand that into other ecosystem services. Like I said, you know, um, what, if, what if we develop markets for clean water and for grizzly bear and elk habitat and, and things like that? I mean, this has been talked about for a long time. Um, the idea has floated around there, but we haven't really, you know, landed on anything real specific. But I think 
I think there's some opportunities in that area to um, to be able to to raise some capital to do do some work. But we we definitely need new tools, and we need venture capitalists that are willing to take some risks and try new things in the landscape. Great, Mr. Kaufman. Um, well, I, I, I agree with Gary and Brent have both said, um, and I don't have anything particularly innovative, but but I do think um, we I, I do think that we don't um, you know we don't value um, these large landscapes. We don't value the way they function, right? So. How many of the millions of visitors that go to Yellowstone and Grand Teton, well, when, when they're on their way to Yellowstone and Grand Teton, they move past, the, they, they drive right past the winter range of the Red Desert to Hoback migration. And they don't give it a second thought. It looks like it's just a big open empty sea to most tourists, right? They don't, they, they don't um, understand that that big open sea provides the wintering habitat of the animals that they're going to see two days later when they get up in the park on their summer range. And so, you know, like we see this time and time again in the greater Yellowstone, there is this focus on the park, right? And, you know, I think, uh, my colleague Arthur Middleton is, you know, has really, I think, um, articulated this really well and pointed out that, you know, all of, a lot of that wildlife that you see in the park, it's all in, you're seeing it on their summer range. Those and and it's the pri big private ranches from the three different states that support the winter range of those elk herds that then support the wolves and the grizzly bears, and um, so we need to recognize that we, there's a lot of talk about the amenity value of Yellowstone, but it's disconnected from the amenity value of all those big private working lands. And you can't have like, it's, it's one system, right? It's all, it's, it's literally connected through these migrations, right? Um, so, so I don't have an innovative funding source, but, um, I think we need to we need to when we think about what we're funding and what we're valuing, we need to be thinking at this broader landscape. Um, as a, a quick footnote, I want everyone who's tuned in tonight to be able to go to the comments. Uh, some of our panelists have posted some great th great linkages. Um, there are linkages for land trust to support and other conservation organizations. This is really important. I would say all of the efforts uh, with our panelists tonight too. I also want to put in a plug uh, for Ms. Schlachter over there. It is important to support our public library and entities like uh, the Jackson Hole Historical Society. So, okay. I would like each of you to pose a question to one of your colleagues. Uh, I want you to make your colleagues squirm with the question uh, so that you'll entertain us. Um, I want you to ask each of them a difficult question. It has to be on the point of wildlife and conservation. It can't be about anything. Uh... <laughs> so, Brent, let's start with you. Fire one away. All right, so I'd like to ask Matt, um... With all of the wildlife mapping, how, how comprehensive do you feel like um, focusing on ungulates and with the limitations of, you know, the amount of colors that you can put on, um, how, how, how big of an umbrella, I guess, is what I'm asking. Do you think you're casting for the connectivity of the land? And I'm going to make this a two-parter, too. And, and also... Um, how do we know that the corridors that are mapped today are going to be the corridors that are going to be used tomorrow? Yeah, good. So can you, so the first part of that question, um, I didn't quite get what you mean, what you meant by that. 
So if, if we're looking at broad landscape connectivity, um, hopefully we're gonna connect the landscape for all species. And so I'm just asking about the limitations of the funding and the science and the technology of, of you know, coloring, um, you know, what's essentially a handful of ungulate species that, that do the long spectacular migrations. Do you think that's a good surrogate to provide an umbrella for all of the, all of the connectivity needs across the landscape or uh, what else is needed? Yeah, um, well, so, so we certainly have the goal, uh, at, least, at least in Wyoming, we certainly have the goal of mapping all the migrations, right? And we're actually well on our way to doing that. Um, so, so I think that's within our grasp, even, even like within a decade. Um, and lots of other states are working towards that goal as well. Um, and there's just, there's nothing, there's no information better from, you know, putting a collar on an animal and allowing them to tell you where they need to migrate and where they need to be in summer and where they need to be in winter. Um, will it be an umbrella? I mean, I, you know, I think that's a, that, that's a kind of open question. Um, clearly the migrations, you know, connect some of these landscapes um, in ways that probably jive with the, with the requirements of other species. But, you know, I, I, I don't think we should expect that there, that, that the ungulate migrations are going to be the, you know, are, are some magical umbrella where that's going to capture the, the habitat requirements of other, of other species. Um, they do, you know, they do connect the landscapes um, naturally, right, from, from the, 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 the sagebrush basins up into the mountains and the alpine, just because that's the gradient that the animals move across. Um, and then, so I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a panacea, but it is, um, but it is, but it is very important to conserve these corridors in order to conserve the ungulate herds, right? Which, as we've already talked about, you know, have, have a myriad of ecosystem benefits, including you know, providing the prey base for wolves and grizzlies and wolverines and, and everything else, supporting these multi-billion dollar hunting and tourism economies throughout the ecosystem, right? There's, there are many ecosystem benefits fl that flow from a healthy, abundant ungulate herd and its intact migrations. So I don't think we should lose sight of that fact. And then with respect to um, or climate change and sort of future conditions, that's an open question. It's one that um, we're doing some research on. Um, yeah, we need to understand how the corridors need will need to change as the climate changes. Um, but we're not. But that's really not where we're at with conservation right now. Like we have a lot of energy development in Wyoming and elsewhere in the West. We're drilling for you know to increase the domestic energy output of the federal government without knowing where the current corridors are, right? So, you know, the simple answer there is we got to start with what the animals are doing right now. And, you know, then we can think about where the corridors might need to shift in, in the future. Do you mind talking for a second? Okay. Give me one sec. All right. Gary, how about a question for Brent? Well, Brent, you know, we map these cor we map these corridors and the animal movement and we map all the, you know, the impacts that you've presented on, you know, in your GIS maps. And essentially, are we just filling in, in Ukraine, you know, crayoning inside the line to know that Yellowstone is an island in a fragment and that we probably should have put a lot more energy in maintaining the broader landscape connections that don't make Yellowstone an island. Yeah, I, I think I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, so just an example. So the, the map that I showed up showed with the, the grizzly bears. Uh, I worked with Future West um, to do a, an analysis where we we took that we drilled down a little bit deeper and we looked at those areas that have not been developed. You know, lots that haven't been developed yet, and but um, but could be and would 
block off critical connections across that landscape. And then we work with a land trust to see if are there innovative solutions where you can go in and actually you know try and conserve these 10, 20, 30 acre parcels, multiple landowners. And the answer we came up with was no. <laughs> It's just, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't find a deal with any of them out there, you know, because it just becomes too hard at that point. So yeah, you need to, you need to be looking at that large landscape and you, you really need to be concentrating on it. And again, get ahead of the game with the planning and try and figure out ways to, to leave those spaces in that landscape so you don't get down to that level where you're having to, to drill down into that, you know, and basically map the loss. Matt, do you have a question for Gary of something that ties in, you know, Wyoming Migration Initiative, maybe into globally or lessons or anything? I mean, you've got such a great perspective and Gary does. Um, would just love to see what questions you have. Okay, well, you, you don't get to put sideboards on my okay, question. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is actually for both Brent and Gary. And the, the question is, so one of the things um, that I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, one of the things that I think is sort of simple in a way with the work that we do with migration corridors is, you know, the animals tell us where they need to migrate. We collar them, they, they make the migrations, they come back, they do it again. And then we take that data and we, you know, give it to the public and give it to the managers. And one of the things that's, I think, been really successful about that is that nobody argues about, is that the corridor? It's obvious the corridor that, you know, there's, there's 40 collared animals moving along at 150 miles and then coming back every, like nobody argues about that, right? Um, I know Gary, you've been involved in the into the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative, and I, think it, Brent, I'm not sure if I think WCS has probably been involved in that as well. But I've always seen that as, you know, so that's a much larger corridor, uh, and it's a corridor that no one animal uses across its entirety, right? The the Yellowstone to Yukon, the the, the notion is. It's, it's more of a gene flow notion that you know, animals will disperse along it and over generations that the, the population or, or metapopulations you know, move across that. And so the question is, how do we articulate? I mean, obviously we need those large intact landscapes as well, especially in, in, you know, as, we, as we face climate change, but how do we articulate in clear terms you know, why we need those migration, why we need a why to why. Why does that whole area have to be connected? It's obvious why the Red Desert to Hoback needs to be connected because the muley are gonna walk across its entire length every spring and every fall. So that's the, that's the question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, um, what I tell people is that connectivity is a, um, a addition of local connectedness. We focus on ungulates like yourself, and we think that connectivity is defined by the by the average path that the mule deer travels in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But is it the average path that an amphibian needs to get to a vernal pool? Is it the path that's needed by the wolverine? Is it the path uh, that's needed by the wolf? And 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 what it says is that connectivity works because there is a constant flow of life within a landscape. And a lot of it's defined by enduring features or seasonality that's based on those, those physical elements. And when we lose, you know, these, when we lose um, landscapes and, you know, from the big to the smaller, we're losing that local connectedness and we lose the process of animal movement that sustains life at all scales. So, uh, you know, I, I know that everyone looks at why to why is this 2000 mile long thing, this landscape, but it encompasses the, 
the functionality, the global level functionality of nature. And because we all interact with nature in our, in our own sense of place, but nature interacts with itself at a much larger scale. So I, I, I really think that when we look at this issue, we have to make sure that we understand that it's not just a point in time and it's not just a point, just the species that's out there. It is maintaining the flow of life because if life cannot move, there is no life. And that affects everything that we depend on in terms of nature, what nature services for us. I know that's a little bit very conceptual, but you know, it is, we put a lot on the backs of the turtle that Native Americans, you know, who define North America, they described us as the continent, the turtle, um, because they use these kind of metaphors to describe these interconnected aspects of life that really are, are, are how nature functions. So I would answer that by saying Wolverine. Um, yeah, years ago, I was involved with the WCS Wolverine project and there were a number of studies that were going on at that time, um, you know, learning what we could about Wolverine on the landscape. And collectively among all those studies, what we learned was, you know, they live in these island-like high elevation habitats that are semi-isolated from other habitats for Wolverine. And they have to be able to move across that, that landscape, that broad landscape to be able to connect from one habitat to the other. But also what we learned is because they live in such low population densities that no one island habitat contains enough wolverines to sustain a genetically viable population of wolverines. So for the long haul, if we wanna have them on this landscape, you have to have genetic movement of wolverines from Canada down into the United States and you have to have movement between Wolverines and the greater Yellowstone, the um, crown of the continent, the Northern Continental Divide, and in the uh, central Idaho wilderness areas. If you lose any of those, you're done. You've lost an iconic species from the landscape. So that's how important connectivity is at that scale. Okay, so we're, we're moving toward the end. We're in our last 10 minutes of game time tonight. And I, I wanna ask each of you this question and then will uh, uh, bring it to a close. The question is a rhetorical one. Do we need a regional bioregional vision in Greater Yellowstone? I would assume that you would say yes. How do we get at it? How do we do it? <laughs> yes, and I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, we, we, we clearly do. I mean, for the reasons that I just explained, you know, we have species, you know, and as Gary said too, nature works on a very grand scale. You know, at one time uh, we considered a national park as a self-contained unit, but that didn't work. And then the Craigheads came along and studied grizzly bears and they uh, defined the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as the area needed to contain a viable population of grizzly bears. Now wolverines come along and we know that we need an even larger expanse of, of habitat to manage across um, to be able to maintain all of the species on this landscape. So yeah, we definitely need a bioregional approach. How we do it, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. I'll let Matt have the last word because I'm gonna say something that should not be the last word. Um, you know, I'm a big f believer in the landscape conservation cooperatives, and they went away in the last administration. Congress kept funding them, but the Department of Interior said no. National Academy of Sciences says this is the way forward. We have to have collaborative, stakeholder-driven, ground-up conservation planning across all agencies and stakeholder groups in major geographies. I wish the LCCs would come back. They may not be under the Fish and Wildlife Service. Maybe they're under the Department of Environmental Quality. But I think, you know, you know and, it, and it can be fixed. I don't think it was perfect. But I think we need that collaborative planning process that brings the stakeholders together. And I think there needs to be one specifically for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um. This is a really hard question, Todd. I don't think there were going to be hard questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, 
I don't know. Like, I mean, like Brent and Gary, I don't, I don't really know. I think one of the things, um, I mean, obviously, uh, we have focused on the migrations and uh, the migrations themselves connect the ecosystem, right? I think they, they sort of speak to, you know, the mountains provide you what the plains can't and vice versa, right? Um, and I think, so, you know, with respect to the migrations, you know, we've, uh, we, we've done a lot of work. I mean, the reason we created the Wyoming Migration Initiative was to, because we didn't think the public knew these stories, but that they needed to. And, um, and it, you know, so I think, uh, so I guess I'd make a plug for, you know, science communication, right? Which a lot of scientists are doing these days, um, you know, taking the work that, that we learn and not just publishing it in, in a peer reviewed paper that nobody reads or a few of your colleagues read, but, you know, we now have social media channels where you can, you can get that information right out to people in their, at their dining room table. Um, one of the things that, that we do um, with, uh, with the Red Desert to Hoback is we have a live tracking social media um, program. So we have a couple animals and when they start migrating every week, we send out a map um, of the, the progress of the migration. And um, we send this out over our Facebook page and, and Twitter. And especially on Facebook, it's been extremely popular and it's really, it's really fun to watch. Um, a lot of the Facebook followers are, are, are from Wyoming, right? And they've, they've traveled these same landscapes. And so, you know, they're on there making comments about, oh, I didn't think she'd, she'd go over that ridge. I thought she'd go down, you know, that drainage and then up over and, you know, and then the next comment is like, hey, this is cool. Mom, show dad, right? And um, it's always show dad because, you get it. And, um, and uh, so, you know, we've been like, that's, that's the effort that we've been doing is we, like we said, we talked before that these migrations are sort of invisible to us, which they are, but they're also like totally understandable to us, right? We all make the same journeys, right? We live in the valleys and we go up in the mountains to fish or hunt or camp or climb or whatever, right? So we, we, all, we all make those same journeys that, that, you know, for us, we do it for recreation. For these animals, they do it for survival. So um, yeah, that's, you know, so I think, I think there's a lot of appetite for these stories. Um, and, um, you know, the public wants to, know, wants to know and wants to learn about these migrations. And they, they want to understand the greater Yellowstone in the way that you sort of challenged us to. But it's and it's our challenge to sort of, you know, help them learn. So I guess that I'll, I'll leave it there. All right, excellent. So we're we're coming to the end. I want a, a couple announcements. I promised the three panelists that I wouldn't press them too hard on political things because it's dicey. Uh, Mr. Tabor, you ventured into the hot water. I appreciate that. Um, there is a, another thing coming up on March 10th by Future West. It's titled Rural Sprawl in the Northern Rockies and its Impacts on Wildlife. This will be more of a community interface and it's going to feature uh, Brent Brock and Dr. Andy Hansen from MSU. So that you should tune into that and go to the Future West website. There are lots of groups that are that are online tonight that I would love to name, but I can't because I'll leave somebody out. Um, the next thing is, for all of you who have tuned in, um, I encourage you and welcome you to follow uh, Mountain Journal at mountainjournal.org. Um, we're trying to bring a, a big perspective and hopefully we can get uh, these folks and others together again uh, in the future. Um, Again, another shout out uh, to Leah and uh, the library and the historical society. And what I'd like to leave tonight is um, thoughts from our three panelists. You each get a minute or two, but I want you to um, tell the people who are tuned in tonight, give them a message 
that they can come convey as an ambassador of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to their family and friends that you think would be worthwhile. So what's a message that's important to spread to advance uh, protection of the, this natural world we love here? I'll, I'll go first since uh, I haven't gone first in a little while. So my message is, um, I guess maybe simple. Um, so the map that Todd showed at the at the beginning of this talk. Um, so we now have a much better map, Todd, um, which, I was gonna, me. which I was going to show, but it's not ready for prime time. Um, which shows, you know, some of the migrations I've showed, but basically those elk and all the, the pronghorn and mule deer migrations and moose and bighorn sheep, um, you know, across the entire ecosystem. And over the last year or so, we've been working with partners around the world, um, working on mapping migrations and, and thinking about what's needed to map migrations of things like wildebeest in the Serengeti and Mongolian gazelle and Arctic caribou and white-eared cob in Africa. And, you know, those are the, some of the poster children for, for ungulate migrations globally. And what's been interesting is that as we've sort of been pulling this data together and seeing what is known about these movements of, glo of migrations globally, it's become very clear that there's no place on the planet that we know as much about these migrations as we do in the greater Yellowstone. It's unparalleled on the planet. And that's a function of both the sort of geography, the fact that many of these herds need to migrate to survive on this landscape, and the fact that it's the world's first national park and it's always been a scientific laboratory. And so there's been a huge investment by lots of groups to understand these migrations. So this is ground zero for not just understanding the science of migration, but also um, where we probably have the best opportunity to conserve it globally. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll go next. So Matt brought up the idea of culture. What is culture? Culture is adaptive learning to changing environmental conditions. I mean, that's what it is. Migrations can be adapted. Animals are learning, they need to learn. Culture is critical in many species. And the thing is, culture is defines what a human being is as well. So if certain species require cultures to adapt to changing environmental conditions, I put it to you all, we have to adapt as well. And this is a changing environmental condition. And for us to work on the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, we have to adapt and be better stewards of this ecosystem and really work together better. Because better. coexistence isn't just between wildlife and humans. It's between humans and humans to save wildlife. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Todd, I'm going to have to apologize. It wouldn't be a Zoom call if if my screen didn't freeze up when you were asking the final grand question, so I didn't hear it. So, <laughs> so, so what's a message to the viewers tonight that they can cloud seed with friends and family members about stepping forward and, and what's important that, that we need to be spreading the word about in terms of the importance of Greater Yellowstone? Yeah, I, I guess I would go back to my initial comments is that, um, you know, when you look at this ecosystem, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. A lot of hard work has gone into this landscape to bring it to where it is. And, you know, we, we have a landscape that 70% of the land cover is in the public domain. Um, we need to figure out, how, we should be able to figure this out. And we can figure this out. But we're on the cusp of, of being able to achieve something that just hasn't been done. This is what we've been working for for over a century now, is to bring back these systems that have been on the brink and bring them back to full recovery and security for the future. Um, so I think we should think about that. The opportunity that's in front of us is great. 
but it's going to require getting serious and as Gary said, developing that culture where we adopt that and we decide that it's important enough to do what needs to be done to make it happen. So with that, thank you panelists. This has been uh, very edifying and informative for me. I hope it's been for you too, Leah. Um, great job on this tonight. Great job and uh, what an honor to have uh, this world-class insight here. Uh, very grateful and I hope we can do this again. So for all of you who tuned in, good night. Thanks. Thank you, the honor was mine. That was wonderful. Thank you. And we will we recorded this and we'll put the link on the Teton County Library uh, website. And I'm not sure if the Historical Society will share it as well. Um, and we'll try to save the chat and put some of the links and stuff like that into a document that's shareable on the library website as well. So excellent. Um, we can preserve this and continue the conversation. And I did earlier drop a survey in the chat if anybody could fill that out, that'd be great. Otherwise, if you have any questions, I'm dropping my email in the chat and you can just email me about anything and I can answer that for you. But thank you so much for joining us and the panelists, you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks everybody. Good night. Good night.